Hello and welcome to Scripture, verse by verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we are in the book of Luke, chapter 18, and we begin our study in verse 27. And let's begin with prayer. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 18, we'll begin our study in verse 27, but I want to read... Uh, Let's see, let's start back in verse 25 of Luke 18. Jesus says, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with men is possible with God. It's impossible for a wealthy person to save themselves, says Jesus. But God can save a wealthy person. God can do the impossible. Maybe you as a Christian, maybe I as a Christian, cannot convince someone who is well off financially that they need a Savior. And that they should spend less time thinking about the good life and more time thinking about eternity. Maybe we can't convince them to do that, but God can. By His Spirit, He can. That's why sometimes you're much better off talking to God about saving a wealthy person than you are talking to that wealthy person about their need for God. Prayer is very effective. Verse 28, And Peter said, Lo, we have left our homes and followed you. Now I guess Peter, you know, he's a little nervous after hearing Jesus say that it is impossible for a rich man to get saved. And as a result, Peter reminds Christ that he's pretty much broke because he left everything to follow Jesus. 29, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no man who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Stop right there for a second. These things are very important, the things listed here. And they should be a priority with Christians, but not the top priority. Jesus must be more important to us than friends, than homes, than jobs, than family. And sometimes it is the will of God to be away from those things. Verse 30. Who will not receive manifold more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Not more wives or more homes or more children but more of the type of joy that those things normally provide. And so if nothing else, your dedication to God will give you a sense of joy and a sense of contentment, which nothing, not even the things mentioned in verse 29, can provide. Verse 31, And taking the twelve, he said to them, Behold, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. The Son of Man is a reference to Jesus. It's a reference to the Messiah. And they all knew that. And Jesus says, we're going to Jerusalem, and everything that the Old Testament said about the the Messiah is going to be fulfilled. And the apostles are probably thinking, well, that's great. Because that means Jesus is going to rule the world from Jerusalem. It's going to be smooth sailing from this point on. Boy, are they in for a surprise. Look at verse 32. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And stop right there for a second. Notice, Jesus was not taken by surprise with the crucifixion 
and all the horrible things that went along with it. He's walking into a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, and he knows it. But he will do it anyway, because it is for us. He will do it to pay for our sins. Last part of verse 34. And on the third day he will rise. Well, that's the good news. It's going to be rough. But then it's going to be great. Because Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. And again we see, like we did last week, that Jesus sets the pattern for us. First there's work. First there's some rough times. Then the reward. Then the good times. 34. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them. And they did not grasp what was said. The disciples had never been taught all these negative things about the Messiah that Jesus mentioned what happened to him. In fact, they believed the opposite. And so they had a lot of unlearning to do before the truth could really sink in. That's why it's so important to be patient with people. Very important to be patient with people because often, even those with a hunger for truth, even with those who want to do right, oftentimes they have much unlearning to do before biblical truth really has a chance to sink in. 35. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Blind men, like other people with disabilities back in those days, could not find work, and so they were forced to beg. There was nothing else they could do. And this man was doing the best that he could with the hand that was dealt him. Verse 36. And hearing a multitude going by, he inquired what this meant and all the excitement of course is over the fact that Jesus is in town 37 they told him Jesus of Nazareth Nazareth is passing by and maybe for the first time in a long time this blind man had hope because if he can just get the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ maybe Christ will heal him he certainly doesn't have anything to lose So he's going to try his best to get Jesus' attention. Beginning in verse 38, And he cried, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David means Messiah. This beggar was poor and blind and miserable. And he needed mercy. So he said, Jesus, have mercy on me. 39. And those who were in front rebuked him telling him to be silent I guess the crowd's thinking was there's no way that someone as important as Christ would want to be bothered by a blind beggar like this so they try to suppress him and it's it's almost as if they are embarrassed for him embarrassed over him and they try to tell him to be quiet or they do tell him to be quiet It's always easy to tell people what to do when you're not in their shoes. Easy for them to tell this guy to be quiet. They're not the ones sitting at the roadside begging because they're blind. And he's not going to listen to them. Last part of verse 39. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Public opinion didn't matter one bit to this blind fella who knew He needed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wasn't going to let anybody stop him. And when we are desperate enough to seek Christ and not be embarrassed about it, we're going to have God's attention. And this blind fellow, he got Jesus' attention. Last part of verse 40, look at it. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord... Let me receive my sight. Well, it's obvious what this blind man needed. It's obvious what he wanted. But Jesus still wanted him to ask. He is stressing the importance of prayer. Prayer is very important. Prayer is important. God already knows what you need. 
You're not telling them anything new when you pray. Prayer is important, though, because people need to communicate with God. And prayer also keeps us from taking God's goodness for granted. And prayer is important because it also keeps us from having a feeling of entitlement. Chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, he did not stop in the city of Jericho. He passed through the city of Jericho. And he did no miracles in that city. And he didn't save any souls in that city. But he did have, to, he did have work to do on the other side of Jericho, as we will see here, beginning in verse 2. It says there, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and rich. Well now, do you remember in the last chapter, Jesus said that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved? In other words, it's impossible for a rich man to be saved. Well, here we see a very rich man, Zacchaeus the tax collector. In the last chapter, Jesus said it would be easier for a camel to go through an eye of the needle than for a rich man to be saved. And he also said, if you remember, that what was impossible for man was possible for God. And now in this chapter, Jesus will do the impossible by saving a very corrupt and very wealthy sinner, Zacchaeus. Look at verse 3. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not on account of the crowd because he was small of stature. Being short created a problem for Zacchaeus because the crowd was huge and he couldn't see Jesus as a result. So look at verse 4. So he that is Zacchaeus ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Zacchaeus was short, so he had to try harder if he was going to see Jesus. And, you know that old saying, there's a lot of truth to it, where there is a will, there is a way. And since he wanted to see Jesus, he climbed a tree. You know, we all have problems, and we all have weaknesses, that are peculiar to us, that we have to contend with. But people who want to do the right thing do not use those weaknesses as an excuse not to do the right thing. They fight through those weaknesses. They find a way to overcome them. And that's what he did. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For I must stay at your house today. People use words so carelessly. People talk about must wins for their favorite team. Or they talk about how they must do this, or they must go here, or they must go there. And I understand what they're saying. And yet, there's really only one must anything. And that is to do the will of God. We must obey God. We must do what God wants us to do. And Jesus must go to Zacchaeus' home because that tax collector is in danger of hellfire. Verse 6. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. See, Zacchaeus had a heart for God. Underneath all that sin, there was a heart for God. And no one in that crowd of Israelites, believe me, would have ever believed that a no-good thief and tax collector like Zacchaeus would possibly have a heart for God. He would be the last person, anybody would say, had a heart for God. But Jesus knew that deep down, Zacchaeus, there was something about him that would respond to truth. He wanted change. If we supply a willing heart, God will give us the grace to change for the better. Verse 7. And when they saw it, they all murmured. Religious rulers, of course. They murmured 
And they said, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And there we see, the Lord ticked off the Pharisees again. So what else is new? You know, you must, talk about must things, you must tick people like the Pharisees off. Because if you don't make people like that angry, you're probably not doing your job. Jesus said, it woe to you when all men speak well of you. You're not right with God if you don't upset sinners every now and then. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Zacchaeus really appreciates his salvation, his forgiveness. Zacchaeus knows that it took a lot of grace for God to save him. And he appreciates it. And he's shown his appreciation. If someone is saved, then they want to try, if possible, to make up for the bad that they used to do by doing good. Out of appreciation for God's mercy. Verse 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. Well now, Zacchaeus had always been a son of Abraham. Physically. He's always been a physical descendant of Abraham. But now he's a spiritual son of Abraham because like Abraham, he has been saved by his faith. Ten. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. God has always been in the business of seeking out and saving lost souls. I mean, that goes way back even to the time of Adam, the first lost sinner. Who was it that went looking after who? It wasn't Adam going looking for God after he sinned. He was hiding behind the bushes. It was God that went out looking for him, trying to get him to confess and be reconciled. If God did not seek us out and do everything he could to get us to repent, we would grope around in spiritual darkness until our condemned souls went to hell. And that's because, as lost sinners, by nature, we stay away from God. We hunt, we hide from God. Verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. And so right now, the disciples of Jesus are thinking, even though he has mentioned his suffering, right now they're thinking, boy, when, when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, it's going to be smooth sailing from this point on. It's going to be great. He's going to defeat Rome. He's going to set up his kingdom. Everything will be wonderful. And so Jesus is going to tell a parable to try to lower their expectations, to get them understand, to understand what the kingdom of God really means. It means the church age. Twelve. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom and then return. Now, the nobleman in this little story that Jesus is telling is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. After dying for our sin... Jesus went to a far country, like the man in this story. He went to a far country. The Lord's far country was heaven. And like this man in the story, Jesus went to heaven to receive a kingdom. In other words, he went to receive the position that he had before he humbled himself and became a man. And like the man in this story, Jesus is going to return. So, look at 13. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten pounds and said to them, Trade with these till I come. Before the man leaves for his far country, he dishes out some assignments. He has some servants who are his. They belong to him. And he gives each one of these servants a job. And he gives each one of these servants the means to do that job, and also some time to do that job, before he returns in order to judge their work. Verse 14. 
But his citizens hated him and sent an embassy after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Now don't get the citizens in this little story confused with the servants because they're not the same. The servants belong to this man who went away, to this ruler. The citizens, that's different entirely. Those people are different entirely. The the citizens sent word to the man that they were going to do things their own way. And they had no intentions of letting him rule over them. They said, you have no right to rule over us. And those citizens are a picture of the Jewish rulers who rejected Jesus Christ and the vast majority of people, nation Israel. They rejected Christ. In essence, they told God, we don't want Christ, your son, to rule over us. Just like the citizens in this story. 15. When he returned, having received the kingdom. Stop right there. The citizens in this story did not want that man to be king. Too bad. He is king. That's just the way it is. Whether they want it or not, it doesn't matter. And most people do not want Jesus Christ to be king. And most people do not want Jesus Christ to rule over them. Well, he is king. And it doesn't matter what they want. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. Meaning he is God, reigning as God. Notice 15 again. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by trading. It is time for the servants to give an account. He has returned. It's time for judgment. And everyone is accountable to Jesus Christ. That is the lesson of this verse. We are all accountable to Jesus Christ. The lost are accountable to him for their sins. And Christians are accountable to Jesus Christ for their faithfulness to Christ. Which will in some way determine how much they enjoy eternity. Verse 16. The first came before him saying, Lord, your pound has made ten pounds more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. This man used what he had. He did a real good job with it. He used it faithfully and he was rewarded according to his faithfulness. What about the next servant? Verse 18. And the second came saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. And so this man had been given the same to work with, the same opportunities to work with as the first person, as the first servant. But he only did half as much as what that first servant did. As a result, his his reward was half of that of the first servant. Lesson for us. A Christian's dedication to God does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. If we are faithful to a lesser degree then we will be rewarded to a lesser degree than someone who went all out for Christ. There will be consequences after we die. 20. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your pound, for I kept, which I kept laid away in a napkin. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap which you did not sow. This man's view of God was all twisted. He didn't know God as well as he should have. Because if he would have, he would have known that God was not unfair and harsh like he said. He didn't understand God. And because he didn't understand God, he didn't love God. And because he didn't love God, he did not serve God. And there's a lesson for us there. The more we know God, the more we'll want to do for him because he's just that kind of a God who inspires good works. And that's why the word of God is so important because that's where we really get to know him. 22. 
He said to him, I will condemn you. Out of your own mouth, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow. In other words, you were right about one thing. I am a severe man. He tells this third servant. He says, you're right. I mean business when I judge. And you will now find that out. Verse 23. Why then did you not put my money into the bank? And at my coming, I should have collected it with interest. In other words, you should have at least invested my money in the safest possible place. You could have at least done that so that I could have earned a little bit of interest anyway. Bottom line is, this servant was lazy and indifferent towards his master. He was servant in position only. He was servant in position, but you could never tell by observing him that he was this man's servant. And that's the way it is with a lot of Christians, too. Some people are Christians in position only. But like this man, the evidence of their relationship with God would be very much too flimsy to convince a jury. 24. And he said to those who stood by, Take the pound from him and give it to him who has ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten pounds. And so the one who earned the most was given more to work with. And that only makes sense. Like any wise business person, the master will put his money where it has the best chance of growing. And when God sees that a Christian can be trusted, to do the little things well, then God will entrust that Christian with even more opportunities. 26. I tell you that to everyone who has will more be given, but from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, faithfulness to God leads to reward. But a Christian with a bad attitude will find out that his life was wasted And he will know that in eternity. 27. But as to these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. Now remember I told you that the servants were different from the citizens of that country who Jesus refers to as enemies. The three servants represented three Christians with three different levels of commitment. To Christ. The enemies mentioned here, they are not Christians at all. They don't belong to Christ at all. And notice, they don't just lose the rewards. They suffer pain. Now, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that today is the day of redemption. It says that because you're not guaranteed another day. You have an opportunity to receive Christ right now if you want to. You must repent of your sin. And you must turn to Him and make Him the Lord of your life if you want eternal life. But the choice is yours. If you want to pray to receive Christ, pray with me right now. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any prayer requests, any questions or any comments, if I've said something today that you don't agree with, you want to talk to me about it, whatever, feel free to write me or call me. The address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's scripture verse by verse, post office box 2211, WASA 54402 2211, or you can call area code 715 842 9021. That's 715 842 9021. If you want more of the Word, even though this program is over, you can get more of the Word. You can go to scripture verse by verse. Dot O-R-G, and listen to uh, 
uh, many messages on the Word of God, and there are new ones being put up there every day. So you can go through an entire book of the Bible. It's not video, but it is audio. Again, that's scriptureversebyverse.org. If you want to join us for Sunday morning worship, we have a very simple service. It lasts about 55 minutes, a couple of songs, Holy Communion, and then the Word of God verse by verse. Give me a call, and I'll tell you where we're meeting. And also, there's a Wednesday evening Bible study where I teach through a book of the Bible verse by verse. Again, that phone number is 842-9021. Until next week, Michael Murat here for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.